Hello, my name is uh, Atif Bakai. I'm a, a peripheral vascular surgeon. And uh, today I will be speaking to you in uh, regards to treatment options for deep venous thrombosis, uh, which is a very um, high yield topic, um, which is a very important topic and is something that we see uh, in my specialty almost on a daily basis. And so we will talk about how to treat uh, and define different locations for deep venous thrombosis and go over treatment algorithms. Uh, just a little introduction about myself. I'm a, a peripheral vascular surgeon. Um, I graduated from medical school in 2007 um, from Loyola Strip School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. And then I um, did my general surgery residency and then did a vascular fellowship um, and completed that in 2014. And I have been in practice now for six years. Um, I am the division chief of vascular surgery for the Amida uh, Health, Heart and Vascular Institute, um, which is based out of Chicago, Illinois. And uh, I am a peripheral vascular surgeon, so I specialize in um, all areas of the body from pretty much from head to toe um, outside the heart. So that's what differentiates what I do from a, from a cardiothoracic surgeon um, that's, that specializes in the heart. So that's a little bit of introduction about myself and uh, let's get right to it. So when we talk about deep venous thrombosis, the most common place that we see uh, deep venous thrombosis occurring or DVTs um, is in the legs. Um, and they're, they're far more common in the lower extremities than they are in the upper extremities. And when we define the location of the deep venous thrombosis, we break it up into pretty much three areas. And the um, treatment will also vary based on these three areas. So the one that you can see here is what we talk about iliofemoral deep venous thrombosis. So iliofemoral is pretty much defined as any DVT that is involved in any of the iliac veins, um, which as going back to anatomy, um, you have iliac veins on both sides that connect and form the inferior vena cava or IVC. So pretty much anywhere from the iliac veins down to the common femoral vein. So the common iliac vein will then branch into the internal and external iliac vein. And then as it crosses under the inguinal ligament will then become the common femoral vein. So an iliofemoral DVT is um, a, complete, a complete or partial thrombosis of any part of the common iliac, external iliac, and the common femoral vein, um, it, that comes under that classification. So then as we go one step down further and we talk about femoral popliteal DVTs, now you're talking after the common femoral vein, the veins will branch then into a deep profunda vein and also the femoral vein. Now the femoral vein a lot of times is, was misclassified in the past as being called a superficial femoral vein um, because the artery is called superficial femoral artery. But that nomenclature was then changed because um, it was perceived as that, oh, it's a superficial vein when it's not, it's actually a deep vein. And so that nomenclature was changed and now it's just called the femoral vein. So the femoral vein or the popliteal vein or the deep femoral vein, that comes under the classification that we call femoral popliteal DVT. Then as you get below the knee and then the popliteal vein now starts branching into the veins in the calf, uh, which include the anterior tibial vein, the posterior tibial vein, the perineal veins, uh, soleal vein, there's a gastrocnemius vein. All these veins are called your calf vein, calf veins, um, and a clot in them is called a calf vein DVT. And so for that, the algorithm will be different than the other two, and we'll go through that process. But it's very important to be able to 
understand the treatments for DVTs is very different, but you have to understand the anatomy and know exactly what we're talking about. So first let's start with iliofemoral DVTs. There's different etiologies as to why people can develop iliofemoral DVTs. Um, one of the most common reasons that we see it is a phenomenon called May Thurner syndrome. And this is uh, called based on um, looking at a clot that commonly occurs in the left common iliac vein um, and is caused by where the uh, artery to the right leg with the right common iliac artery crosses over the left common iliac vein. And as they're sitting on top of each other, as the vein, as the artery is crossing on top of the vein that's running underneath, it causes a compression to occur of the femoral vein. Um, as you know, arteries are, have a muscular wall to them and are very, um, you cannot compress an artery very easily. Whereas a vein, um, the way I describe it is like a, a piece of paper. Whereas if you have a, a vein and you, and if you're looking at it, you can very easily compress the vein just by pushing on it. This is how a vein works. Whereas an artery is, got, is very rigid and you can't compress it. So when the artery is running on top of the vein, it causes compression of the vein and if the compression is shut down. The clot is from the blood not moving or what we call stasis. So if you have... Um, compression occurring on the vein and the blood is not moving as freely as it needs to, that causes stasis and that can cause the blood to clot. Um, another common reason is post-surgery. The most common time that we see this is people that have orthopedic procedures done. They have hip replacements, knee replacements. And so when people aren't moving as much, are, 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 and they're bed bound, they are at high risk of developing blood clots, which is a common reason why we put people on low doses of blood thinners after surgery. And that's to prevent people from having a blood clot after surgery. Um, you'll see people have these, um, what are called sequential compression devices or SCDs in their calf and they're designed to compress the calf to keep the blood circulating so that there's not a stasis of blood and, a, and risk of developing clots. So post-surgery is another common reason. Um, anytime that anybody is immobilized, um, that, that can cause people to develop blood clots. Uh, and the immobilization could be for any reason. They've been in a, they've been in a car accident. And, um, they've been in any kind of trauma situation. And, um, they've been paralyzed, um, they have a spinal cord injury, and all those things, they puts them at a high risk for developing blood clots. And then when you can't put them into any other clot category, then you, there's always the idiopathic, the ones that we don't know why they developed a blood clot. Um, and those come under that category. A lot of times people may have genetic predispositions that predispose them to developing blood clots. Um, so those are, those are the, the most common reasons why people develop iliofemoral DVTs. What are the symptoms involved? Well, one of the most common symptoms that you'll see with any blood clot is pain, um, pain and swelling. Um, but when you have a clot that's very proximal, which is involving the iliofemoral system, now it causes the leg to have massive amounts of swelling because veins have always have a way to find a way to get back to the heart. If you have a blood clot in the calf in one of the veins, there's multiple other veins that can pick up the slack and allow for the leg to drain. When you get a, a blood clot in the uh, femoral popliteal segment, there's 
also more, more than one vein that will be able to pick up the slack. However, when you get very proximally, especially in the acute setting, the blood clot now prevents any of the veins from draining because they're all draining into the same system. And when the clot is up here and, they, and, and, and none of them can drain, you get a significant amount of swelling. And this is what we call phlegmasia. Um, and if you see it once, you'll never forget it um, because it's very, very impressive. And I have some pictures that I could show you on that. Um, somebody that has a low-grade fever, uh, commonly after any surgical procedure, we talk about why people can get a post-operative fever. Um, the most common reason is that they're not taking a deep enough breath, and so their, their uh, alveoli are collapsing, something we call atelectasis, and that's a very common cause why people develop post-op fevers. But um, aside from the obvious things, sometimes when you can't explain why somebody has a persistent low-grade fever, sometimes it's because they've developed a blood clot and we just haven't found it yet. So that those are all the things to keep in mind. This is a picture of somebody that has phlegmasia. This is the same patient. Um, and you see how one leg is massively swollen than the other. But not only that, if you look at the color, you can tell that there's a marked difference between the color. This is what I would call a surgical emergency. Um, because when there is significant outflow obstruction of the leg in being able to drain, what happens is that now the leg gets threatened where it can, you can develop gangrene of the leg because the leg can't drain. There's so much congestion occurring that the leg can't drain appropriately. And therefore that causes the leg to not be able to survive. Um, and so this is what we call a surgical emergency. So let's talk a little bit about what I just explained to you with May 3rd syndrome. This diagram here clearly explains what I was referring to, is that if you see the right common iliac artery, it crosses over the left common iliac vein. And right in this area is where we commonly see a compression occurring. Other places that you can also see this at is where the right internal iliac artery crosses over the left external iliac artery. And that can also cause a compression to occur there. So therefore, these are two reasons, um, anatomic reasons. And it's not an anatomical problem. This is a normal anatomical thing. This is what always happens. Why some people get it and some people don't is not clear. But we know that if you have somebody that has unilateral left leg swelling, that they're this is one thing that you have to have on your differential as to why somebody has unexplained left leg swelling. And as you know, when you have an ultrasound done of the left leg, they don't look at the veins all that high up in the abdomen because it's very hard to see. There's a lot of bowel and things like that that is in the way. And so they can't always clearly visualize or many sonographers don't know to actually look for clots that high up. But the way that you can make the diagnosis is if you have somebody that has a swelling of the left leg and you do an ultrasound and there is no blood clot in the femoral, there's no blood clot in the, the entire leg and the patient does, has unexplained swelling, well, then this has got to be on your differential then. And you can, when, you, when we do ultrasounds of the veins, we look for varying degrees of uh, phasicity that is, is um, due to people's breathing. So when people take in a breath, they, you can see fluctuations depending on whether they're inspiring or, exp or, or, or in expiration. You'll see phasicity occur within the veins as the blood is draining back to the heart. And so when people have a blood clot, the way that you can make the diagnosis is that you lose that phasicity that is occurring. Because there is a proximal obstruction, the, 
difference in inspiration and expiration that you see within the veins is lost because there's an obstruction above it. Um, and so that's one way to look at that. Now this is um, an angiogram, um, which we call a venogram because we're looking at the veins here, where the catheter is on the left side and we're shooting dye up the left venous system. And when you look at this, it may not be very obvious that there's any kind of obstruction, but, but you see a shadow occurring here right at the origin of the left common iliac vein. And when you see this shadow, this is a very classic sign that this is the, the shadow that's occurring is actually the iliac artery, which is causing compression. Now, this is one of the limitations of angiography, is when you look at angiography, you're only looking at two dimensions. And therefore, going back to my example here, when you see, when you're looking at a piece of paper rolled up like this as a vein, and we're looking at it from underneath, we see contrast flowing through. But if even if you were to bend it and make it look like this, you'll still see contrast flowing through in two dimensions, and you will not clearly be able to see that, oh, this is like a pancake, that it's being compressed, but there's still flow going through and it'll look normal on venography. So the way that you figure this out is two ways. One, you change your view. You look at it, try to look at it from a lateral view and see if you see any kind of difference. But the most common way that we look at it is that we will perform a intravascular ultrasound, which is a catheter that's an ultrasound catheter that allows us to go inside the vein and look, look at it and see that we're seeing a full circle. And you're performing an ultrasound from inside the vessel and seeing if there's any kind of compression occurring. So this is how we determine whether that somebody has May Thurner syndrome is by looking and seeing if there's compression occurring and it's very clear um, on intravascular ultrasound. And then therefore in those, in those um, situations, we end up putting a stent into the vein that goes up into the IVC um, to allow the vein to expand and build some rigidity so that the artery is not compressing it. And that usually takes care of the problem. So what do we do in addition to that? Well, you know, the common, common thought is that you know, anybody that gets blood clots, we put them on blood thinners. Um, and we usually put them on blood thinners for about six months. Um, and that is a combination of either putting them on heparin, which is a um, IV blood thinner. And then we transition them to warfarin or Coumadin, um, which is a blood thinner that um, you take by mouth. And so we will, but you know, the, the Coumadin levels take a while to get to therapeutic levels in the blood, and therefore we bridge them with heparin or things like low molecular weight heparin, um, which is known as uh, enoxaparin um, or commonly referred to as Lovenox. Um, and then now there's also newer agents um, that are oral agents, which are direct factor 10 uh, inhibitors, which are um, Xarelto and Eliquis. Um, and so those, and, 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 there's, and there's multiple other agents that have, uh, that have also come out, but those are the most common ones. Um, and so people will get put on blood thinners and this is what happens to them in seven years. This is a patient that had an iliofemoral DVT and they were just put on blood thinners. And in, in seven years, they've developed this significant stasis dermatitis, um, significant swelling. Um, they develop ulcers um, for, for just being put on blood thinners. And that's why it's very important to understand that not all DVTs are the same. And that if you have somebody that has an iliofemoral DVT, that just putting them on blood thinners is not sufficient. And people, as time goes on, will develop venous ulcers, significant stasis dermatitis, something that we refer to as post-thrombotic syndrome. 
post-thrombotic syndrome is, is people that have had a blood clot and the syndrome of symptoms that they develop over time as by just being treated with blood thinners. Um, and they develop a significant swelling and uh, you know stasis and all these constellation of symptoms because they didn't, weren't treated appropriately with the initial diagnosis. And what do we mean by that? Well, we know that 47% of DBT patients will eventually develop post-thrombotic syndrome. And 25 to 33% of these patients with post-thrombotic syndrome will develop severe symptoms such as ulcers and skin deterioration. This has been well studied. And we know that, that this is a significant problem. 75% of the cost of treating DVT is related to post-thrombotic syndrome. It's a significant permanent disability that causes a significant effect on, in our, on our healthcare in that, that if they're not treated appropriately on the initial diagnosis, this is something that people will suffer with for many, many years. I have many patients that come to see me um, with this exact problem asking to see if there's anything that can be done. Well, the reality is that once you've had a blood clot for a long time, it will scar. It'll just fibrose and it'll scar the vein down. And therefore, it's, you're not going to be able to go in and remove it um, because it's now just fibrous scarring. And you, can, and, and you can try to balloon it or stent it or, or do a variety of other things to try to salvage the situation, but this is something that's very preventable if the initial diagnosis is treated appropriately. What's the pathophysiology of post-thrombotic syndrome? Well, we know when there's acute a thrombus that occurs, there's significant inflammation that comes along with it. Um, and that's with, with any uh, blood clot. If you get a blood clot in a superficial vein, Oftentimes, people are in the, um, in the hospital and they have an IV that infiltrates and they develop a blood clot in the location where their IV was. Well, and then, they, then it turns, <clears throat> starts turning red and it turns red and, um, and then it gets inflamed because all blood clots in any location will cause, uh, to some degree, uh, some amount of inflammation. Um, and then that... The, the, but the bigger reason here that happens is that the blood clot will damage the valves in the vein. As you know, veins have valves in them that are designed to keep the blood flowing in one direction. The goal is to try to bring the blood from your legs back up to your heart. But gravity is always working against it, and so it's constantly pulling the blood back down. So that's why we have valves in our veins that are designed to keep the blood only going in one direction. But when you develop a blood clot, it damages those valves. So now those valves don't work. So instead of them working to just keep the blood going in one direction, when one of them is paralyzed because of the blood clot and has caused it to scar, now the blood doesn't go in one direction, it refluxes. And that reflux or obstruction will now, now not allow the uh, blood to drain appropriately. So and that's really the pathophysiology that occurs. And when you and because of that significant amount of swelling that you develop as a result of this, people will develop significant venous hypertension, which causes post-thrombotic syndrome. Um, iliofemoral DVTs are more likely to cause post-thrombotic syndrome than the ones that are lower down because of the fact that um, significant portion of these will uh, will have a recurrent um, blood clot as time goes on because the lumen is narrow. There's a lot of scar tissue and it can, if there's enough narrowing, eventually at some point it'll just clot off again. Uh, so the moment you take these people off of the blood thinners and the blood slows down, going back to what we talked about earlier with stasis, they have a high recurrence of, um, of having deep vein thrombosis. So the post-thrombotic syndrome, what, is, what, is, uh, what happens with these people is that there is a significant impairment of their quality of life. As the DVT causes valvular damage, the residual thrombus will then will propagate until they become symptomatic again. 
They develop significant venous insufficiency, hypertension in their veins, um, and reflux, which contributes to stasis and rethrombosis and causes chronic conditions um, because then people become immobile. They're not moving around as much. And due to their sedentary lifestyle, people start then getting worsening arthritis, chronic lung disease, and angina because now you've increased their cardiovascular risk by making somebody <clears throat> become more sedentary. And so that impairs their daily living, their work performance, and their treatment satisfaction, which was what we call their quality of life. So if you look at <clears throat> the incidence and uh, frequency of post-thrombotic syndrome after a symptomatic DVT, and you, there's, you can tell right here that there has been a lot of studies that have been done looking at patients with symptomatic DVTs and the frequency of them developing post-thrombotic syndrome, depending on how many years after the initial diagnosis. And as you go further along, you see that the incidence begins to increase. Uh, many of these studies, just after two years, you can see that the incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome is very significant, well over 60%. So valve preservation for reduction of post-thrombotic syndrome, we know that the way that we can preserve the valve is by getting rid of the clot early. And by early, I mean within the first week of, of them developing the blood clot. That's why it's so important not only to make the diagnosis, but then to also treat the person once they've made the diagnosis. So how can we remove the, the clot? So we know that if we remove the clot by either lytic therapy, by that I mean um, using clot-busting medications, or using mechanical thrombectomy devices, that if we were to rapidly remove the clot, we can restore the venous flow and preserve the valve function. We're stopping the process of the fibrosis and the chronic DVT occurring where the valve gets damaged to the point where it can't function anymore. And that's why it's really important to get to this early. So once, once the valve function is preserved, people do better. They don't develop this post-thrombotic syndrome. They go back to essentially where they started. Um, there's been many venous thrombectomy trials which have shown significant benefit versus anticoagulation in randomized studies, which is the best data that we can achieve is by having randomized trials and it has shown that there's a significant benefit in these patients from having uh, a thrombectomy performed. Thrombolysis for acute DVT demonstrated significant benefit as well um, in, in preventing post-thrombotic syndrome. And again, this has been researched very heavily and continues to show that in patients that have iliofemoral DVTs, they will do better with thrombolysis. When you put somebody on anticoagulation, the one thing that people commonly say is, well, why can't you just put me on blood thinners and my blood clot will go away? Blood thinners don't cause the clot to go away. Blood thinners prevent clot from propagating, meaning that if you have a blood clot in a certain segment, that below it, there won't, it won't form more clot or, or above it. Um, it does decrease the risk of that blood clot breaking off and causing somebody to have a uh, pulmonary embolus or a clot going from their legs to their lungs, but it does not actually resolve the clot. It does not actually do anything to the clot itself. Your body will try to dissolve the clot. You're basically shifting the focus from the clot in the clotting cascade of basically saying, okay, I can't form any more clot now, but the fibrinolysis that's occurring will then will still continue to occur because our body's constantly doing that. So we kind of shift the seesaw to saying, okay, we're only going to allow the body to do go through fibrinolysis into dissolving the clot, but not allow it to form clot. And that's what our body tries to do, but it does, it's, it's not the blood thinners that are doing that. 
as a result, since you're not doing anything to the clot, you're not preventing valvular damage. You're not preventing the ascension. And you're going to resolve your symptoms rapidly. It does not end up resulting in you preventing post-thrombotic syndrome. And therefore, the, the thrombolysis is what's really the key here. In the evolution of treatment of DDT, this changed quite a bit over the years as people did more and more studies and realized that what the current method of treatment was is not the optimal way of treating blood clots. So if, going back to the 1950s, where the anti, anti, putting people on anticoagulation was the sole method of treating blood clots. That's, that's all that they had. That's all that they could do at that time. And then during that time is when they realized that, well, maybe we should start putting just people on systemic thrombolysis. Now, systemic thrombolysis, what that means is that you're basically giving somebody a very large dose of blood clot busting medicine, most commonly TPA, um, and, and, and allowing their bodies to just break blood clots where You know, because of that heavy dose, now any part of the body that has very fragile, um, like the capillaries in the brain and things like that, they, you know, it can, any small little disruption, which our body quickly heals and seals up, now it does it and it breaks that open and people develop significant amount of hemorrhage. So that's not a very safe way to do that. Uh, but that was what was found and that's what they were trying to currently use in life-saving maneuvers. And there's many times even now that if somebody is, comes in with a significant pulmonary embolus and is actively decompensating, that we will actually give them systemic thrombolysis because it's a life-saving maneuver. We're trying to basically prevent them from dying. And, and then that's, it's either giving them something quickly like that um, because I, they don't have time to be able to make it to the lab. So as time went on in the 1990s, we found that the, a more accurate way of treating somebody with a blood clot is to do catheter-directed thrombolysis. And catheter-directed thrombolysis is that you go into the vein and then you deliver this me uh, medicine, um, TPA, and you give it very locally into the blood clot directly. And then you allow it to marinate for some time and allow the medicine to work. And then, and a lot, and that would prevent the systemic response that, that we were seeing by giving it through the IV in a, high, in a high dose. And that did show to be much more beneficial than doing um, the, the systemic route. Then as we fast forward it to, to 2000, then people, these companies started developing pharmacomechanical thrombolysis, basically using almost a rotor rooter device that will not only deliver the medicine directly into the clot, but then will go run through it and try to just suck out the clot immediately right afterwards. And, 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 and that really stuck. And as those catheters and stuff evolved, today, that's what we do. We will do pharmacomechanical thrombolysis and allow for the medicine to be delivered locally, allow this to marinate, and then in about 15 or 20 minutes after it's had a chance to work, we'll go in there and try to dissolve the clot and suck it out um, so that there's immediate improvement. And it's actually very remarkable because as people uh, when they come in and they're significantly symptomatic with massive swelling in their leg, and then you take them to the lab and you do this, literally right by, by the next morning, their leg is back to normal in size. And, and they're amazed when they look and they say, oh my God, my leg is back to normal. 
Um, and it's very, very gratifying to patients to see that happen. So there's, you know, there was a study done to look at iliofemoral DVTs and doing conventional treatment um, versus lysis and percutaneous transluminal angioplasty and stenting. Um, and this was published uh, in the Annals of Surgery back in 2001 that showed that if you did it just by doing standard therapy versus lytic therapy, there was a significant difference in patency by doing um, lytic therapy, which is obvious, which is what we would expect. But not only that, you saw this effect go on for up to five years, even afterwards, after somebody had, a, um, had the lytic therapy done, that, you, that that effect is maintained. So the, the ACCP guidelines um, in June of 2008 then changed their guidelines and where now the, the uh, American College of Chest Physicians has now said, okay, for somebody that has an iliofemoral DVT, that the first line tra uh, treatment is for them to have catheter-directed thrombolysis in conjunction with anticoagulation. So it's not that we just do lysis and say, oh yeah, the blood clot's gone. We just let them go back to their normal, normal ways. They do end up needing to be on blood thinners, but now we've restored their patency and helped preserve valve function. Because the reality is that you're never gonna get all the clot, but you will get a significant portion of it and to help restoring the patency. So why is thrombo, uh, thrombolysis not more common treatment for DVT? You know, the people, when, when they come in for blood clots, especially most of these patients will come into the ER, the people only think about what to do right now as, as, as it occurs. How do we take care of the acute problem? The post-thrombotic syndrome is not a concern when somebody comes in with an acute problem. And therefore, because many people don't think about that, it's not till years from the initial event that people say, oh, why is my leg always swollen? And it's because they didn't have the proper treatment when they had the initial, initial diagnosis. There's always a concern for bleeding, um, that if or when we give people people thrombolytics that they're gonna, that they may bleed. But what people don't realize is that with these catheter directed thrombolysis treatments, that this is a very, very low risk. In fact, any kind of severe bleeding is well, well under 1%. Um, and, and, and there's patients that we say they cannot be, um, had go undergo thrombolysis. Somebody that just recently had surgery. Um, or somebody that just had, uh, especially any kind of um, neurosurgery. We know that, that those patients, you can't do thrombolysis on because uh, even the smallest amount of bleed would be catastrophic. And so, but the reality is that any risk of severe bleeding is very, very low. And so that's why people don't think about these things and just say, okay, that they should all get thrombolysed. When we talk about what are the different devices, there's, there's multiple devices on the market um, that talk about treatments for DVTs. There's the anticoagulation and compression, which we know that we have to do. There's the pharmacomechanical thrombectomy devices. There's catheter-directed thrombolysis. And then there's ultrasound-accelerated catheter-directed thrombolysis, which is basically a catheter-directed thrombolysis that's got an ultrasonic catheter in it that basically vibrates in the clot to help deliver the clot to different surface surfaces of the blood clot. So the, this is called the ECOS catheter and it was intended for the controlled and selective infusion of thrombolytics into the peripheral vessels. And so it, it delivers the blood clot and then uses low energy ultrasound to try to uh, increase the permeability of the lytic agent into the blood clot to help dissolve it. Um, and then it does all those things that we talked about, 
by dissolving the clot, preserving the valves, um, and allows you to get more thrombus uh, to dissolve and reduce the risk of emboli. And the uh, one major advantage is that <clears throat> you can decrease the risk, the, decrease the dose of the amount of blood clotting drug that you're giving to allow uh, for, for um, less bleeding complications. It's a very predictable result and, um, and, and you really don't decrease your risk of radiation because you just basically deliver this catheter, start delivering the medicine and turn it on and, it, and then the catheter does the rest of the work. There's a, another system which is called a trellis, um, basically where there is two balloons um, that, are, that, it, that are designed to isolate the, the clot segment in the middle. And then as you blow up these two balloons, it then there's a rotating catheters between the two balloons that macerates the clot and then sucks it out so that the clot doesn't shoot off and go anywhere because the balloon is protecting anything from going up forward. Um, and, and you can use that to treat multiple segments. And that's shown here in this segment here on the bottom where you see the two balloons that inflate and then the area in the middle which helps macerate the clot. And there's an aspiration syringe which then you use to suck out the clot. This is probably the most common thing used is angiojet. And what this basically does is that it delivers the medicine into the blood clot. And you can do this with a thrombolytic agent or even without. It's a mechanical thrombectomy device. So you go, you push the catheter in through the clot and suck out the clot. And you can also spray or power pulse is what it's called, um, uh, the lytic agents into the clot and then go in there and suck it out. And this is the most common thing that we use today um, into dissolving these blood clots. This <laughs> is uh, a, a, a picture basically showing what we talked about before. Is venography alone and adequate to evaluate the deep veins? Um, and it's not. And so the, and this is where we talked about the intravascular ultrasound in that the, it, it, when you look at uh, uh, angiography, it's in two dimensions. And so you end up missing many areas where there could be narrowings. Um, and therefore, that's why it's really important to make sure you do intravascular ultrasound, um, which gives you a three-dimensional picture, as you can see in this diagram here, and, and be able to look around from inside the vessel to see if there's any compression occurring of the vein. Um, and that's really the mainstay of treatment. Um, this is, goes back to what we talked about before in people that have May-Thurner syndrome, you'll see that the iliac vein is, is right here. And as you get down further, there's compression occurring of the iliac vein. And therefore you won't see that on venography. But if you look with the Travascar ultrasound, you can see that there's significant compression of the vein occurring. And this also allows us to measure very accurately the diameter of the vein. So when we go in to place a stent, we know exactly what si um, uh, stent size to use. Um, and, and how long of a stent to use. And the way we do this is that we'll have the pa patient on their stomach in a prone position. Uh, a lot when we'll go in through the uh, popliteal and we'll go up the vein. And <clears throat> there's two schools of thought. There's many people that will put in an IBC filter prophylactically. Um, when they're gonna do a thrombolysis just to decrease any potential that if there was a clot that was to uh, break off, that the filter would be able to catch it. And then you can go in later and remove the IVC filter because all the filters we put in now generally are retrievable. And so we'll go in and put a filter into the IVC and then go in and do the uh, thrombolysis from the popliteal vein. So I'm gonna go over some cases here, um, which will kind of help highlight um, 
the things that we've talked about in this lecture. So the first case is a 17 year old male had acute onset of leg swelling and pain, has not had taken any medications, is otherwise healthy, no family history. See, it's always important when you see somebody that you're worried about having a blood clot that you get a good family history of whether there's any clotting disorders in the family. Um, because then obviously it raises your suspicion if uh, somebody did, did have that. He plays football and baseball. He had an ultrasound which demonstrated that he had a common femoral vein. He had a common femoral, femoral, and tibial DVT. So therefore he was transferred for thrombolytic therapy. This was his ultrasound, this was his, uh, sorry, venogram here. And as you can see that, I'd like in the pictures you saw before where the venography should just be all black um, and you see all this haziness, that's because there's blood clot going all the way up, extends up here. And if you get to the common femoral vein uh, right here, you see a bunch of clot. The way you know that and um, by x-ray is if you, if, you, if you can kind of appreciate here that there's the femoral head and that's the, the location of the common femoral vein. Uh, there's clot here and as you get above it, there's no flow going above it. So this patient has a significant blood clot extending from the common iliac, probably going extending into the IVC and going all the way down. The patient then um, ended up getting through a, a venogram which showed that got through the blood clot. This is the IVC that's being seen here, which shows that the flow is in upper and the IVC is okay. And then had an IVC filter placed. And then after angiojet, there was a significant improvement in the flow going through. Not great, but significant improvement. But so this area, um, because there was actual compression occurring of the, um, the vein, which was visualized with IVIS, patient ended up getting a stent placed centrally, which then allowed the flow to be um, improved. And then the filter was taken out at a later time. So this is kind of usually the sequence of events. And this is the completion venogram, which now shows that the flow is going much more briskly um, through the area and the clot has been dissolved. Second case here is a 51-year-old male, the acute onset of le uh, leg swelling and pain. Um, this is two months after a contralateral knee replacement. Um, she's on just one antihypertensive medicine. She's on no hormone replacement. Again, that's also another important question to ask patients is if they're on any kind of hormone therapy because we know that people that are, especially in conjunction with smoking, have a high incidence of developing blood clots. So, and that there's no family history of clotting disorder. She works as a nurse's aide. This is a picture here, which shows a significant amount of swelling in her left leg. Ultrasound was performed, which showed that there, there was significant clot in the common femoral, femoral, and popliteal veins. A CT scan was performed, because um, you know that somebody was actually thinking that it's the left leg. Let's make sure that the patient doesn't have may Thurner syndrome occurring. So a CAT scan will also give you uh, a lot of information because you can see the compression occurring of the iliac vein on CAT scan. Then the patient was transferred um, uh, to us for lytic therapy. Um, the way that we look for blood clots, and this is um, by, uh, based on ultrasound, is that you will look at a vein and then you'll try to compress the vein with the ultrasound. Under nor normal circumstances, veins will compress very easily if there's nothing inside them uh, when you perform a compression maneuver. And in this situation, the vein does not compress, therefore indicating that the patient has a clot. Therefore, patient was brought to the cath lab, ended up getting um, an IVC filter placed. And again, access was obtained from the popliteal vein um, Venogram showed the significant amount of blood clot here. We got through the blood clot up into the IVC. The IVC was patent. Um, a lytic uh, catheter was placed. This is uh, using the um, ECOS catheter that we had talked about previously. So you put a catheter in and then drip thrombolytics overnight. 
and then bring them back the next day for a lysis check, everything's gone. The clot is completely dissolved. The flow is going through very, very nicely. It's as if the patient didn't even have one. You know, intravascular ultrasound was done, which showed that the pain was significant compression. Had a stent placed, and everything looks great. So, in summary, when you look at iliofemoral DVTs, uh, we talk about the post thrombotic morbidity as much as is, is, is a, real, a very real thing, um, and that we need to make sure that we acknowledge that and treat it appropriately. And that the more extensive the thrombus, the more active the patient, the more severe the morbidity, and that um, lysis is the key to preserve valve function. Next thing we'll go through is femoral popliteal DVTs. Femoral popliteal DVTs are similar etiologies except uh, that we talked about for iliofemorals, except the anatomical consideration. And usually if it's less than two weeks of, um, you know, uh, that, that, that patients um, can be offered mechanical thrombectomy um, if it's within um, two weeks of them being diagnosed. But Generally speaking, most of the time, these people would just get anticoagulation um, for three months if it was a provoked DVT. Um, if it was a non-provoked DVT, then usually they require to get a, either a hypercoagulable workup um, or, or further investigation as to why they got the blood clot. If it's unprovoked, anticoagulation should be given for three months, but then you assess the risk factors. Um, you know, the, the, the take home message here is that it's, it's all about using common sense. Um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so you have to do a risk benefit analysis. Anytime you're going to take somebody to the lab to do any kind of invasive procedure, you want to keep in mind that, you know, what's the benefit going to be for the patient? The, as we know, for iliofemoral DVT, there's a clear benefit. And um, for femoral popliteal DVTs, the benefit is not really uh, that dramatic. And so oftentimes for these people, we will um, just treat them with blood thinners and they usually do pretty well. Um, for calf vein DVTs, um, there's, there's, um, there's two treatment options. For people that have risk factors and that are going to be high risk for being put on blood thinners, um, these are your old, um, frail patients that are, have a high fall risk, um, that you're worried that if they fall and they hit their head and they're on blood thinners, that they're going to have a significant head bleed. Therefore, those people, you can put them on just antiplatelet agents like an aspirin um, or a Plavix and then follow them up with serial ultrasounds just to make sure that there is no propagation of the clot. Uh, for people that don't have a high um, risk of any kind of bleeding complications, they're young, they're otherwise healthy, then you know, some people will just put them on anticoagulation for three months and then um, do another ultrasound just to make sure that it's, it's, it's either gone or it's now chronic and you don't need to treat it anymore. But we know that there's no benefit in these patients to doing thrombolysis because there's multiple calf veins. And so if one shuts down, some one of the other ones picks up the slack. So our collective goal is obviously to um, think about the long-term health. We know that chronic venous insufficiency, which is people that develop incompetence of their veins um, over time, it, it occurs in anywhere between 10 to 35% of adults. Um, venous ulcers is the most common form of leg ulcers. And about 4.6 million um, work days are lost annually, are lost annually because of just venous problems. So it's a significant impact on our society and our healthcare and our, and our workforce. Um, so the goal is to ensure that all patients uh, of all their treatment, ensure patients of all their treatment options um, to talk about lifestyle changes, medications, if they're on, um, on, on hormone therapy or of any sort to try to see if we can remove them off of that to um, and making sure that they're appropriately treated. Compression therapy is huge. 
all patients that have ever had a blood clot. Um, I put them in compression therapy to wearing compression stockings um, as much as they possibly can and to assuring that um, they get appropriately treated. Um, and then thinking about you know, vascular and endovascular surgical options. Um, you wanna provide the most appropriate treatment option for each patient, um, treat the underlying disease, not just only the symptoms. Um, and so in, in, in summary, you know, people that have early immobilization, and, you know, you're, you're, you wanna try to get people to get mobilized as soon as possible to, to prevent them from developing blood clots. Um, the time, time is, is very important. Um, and so if you wanna be able to save their, their, their valves and to avoid post-thrombotic syndrome, um, you, you, you wanna try to get to them as early as possible. The best treatment is prevention, but really it takes a team to get these patients treated appropriately. And it starts from, you know, starting from ER physicians to primary care doctors, and then getting to getting appropriate treatment with an interventionalist or a vascular surgeon um, that, that, that does this um, into making sure these people are treated appropriately. Chronic venous insufficiency, this is, you know, you, you, we all see, we, we, I mean, um, I see it very, uh, uh, very many of these patients. Um, and many of these patients are, are, are people that, you know, they may not have had actually a blood clot or whatnot, but they just develop venous insufficiency um, based on their job, the type of job they do. They're constantly on their feet. Um, so people that are like school teachers or uh, people that have a desk sitting job that are constantly sitting for long periods of time, um, these people develop this chronic venous insufficiency as time goes on. Uh, um, and therefore, you know, when it, it can cause them to develop ulcers. And so the treatment algorithm for these is um, you have to put them in compression stockings and make sure that everybody wears compression stockings. Um, and in addition to that, you look for venous reflux in their superficial veins. And then if their superficial veins have significant reflux, then they undergo a, uh, a uh, ablation of their superficial veins to uh, get rid of the chronic venous insufficiency. That's all I have. I thank you very much. I appreciate, um, I hope this was informative and uh, I hope that this um, helps you um, in, in being able to understand the treatment algorithms and treatments for uh, venous insufficiency uh, as well as DVTs and, and how to handle this.